Welcome to Audio Drama Interviews, the only show without a pithy tagline from Audio Drama Reviews. Then again, it doesn't need one. Hello and welcome to Audio Drama Interviews. Today with me, I have a special guest in a galaxy far, far away, but not quite. Richard, is it Tuscan or Tus- Toscan? Tuscan. Toscan, okay. Yeah. Um, so, so what's your, do you like Rick or Rick, Richard or Rick? Uh, I usually go by Rick, so. Okay, cool. Uh, so Rick, tell us how you got started in the audio or radio field of drama. Well, it probably went back to undergraduate days when I fooled around with being a sort of on-campus radio DJ for a while. And when I went off to grad school, I was involved in putting sound together for probably 50 theater productions where I was the paid stage manager and in what we would now call sound designer for all the special effects, uh, music and so on that were used in those productions. I moved to Los Angeles. I was asked if I would join Pacifica Radio as a theater critic. So I did a number of reviews of local productions, and one of those was a docudrama on the Vietnam War. And then a few years later, as I began to listen to earplay and all of this stuff um, from NPR, I began thinking about radio drama more clearly and did an adaptation of a play by Ed Bullens about a jazz musician, therefore had a score that... And then that led to NPR funding me to do a couple of productions, uh, adaptations of a Raymond Chandler story, and then an adaptation of a piece by Damon Knight, who's the guy who developed the, or wrote the story that became the Twilight Zone series. Those two productions were heavily involved in score, sound effects, and so on. Very different from what NPR was doing at the time. And that's what, in a nutshell, led to NPR asking me if I thought a large audience could be developed using radio drama. Awesome. You said a term there that maybe some people aren't familiar with. You said docudrama. Is that like something like fun footage? Well, no, this is really, there's a term in the publishing business in the world of books called literary nonfiction, which is kind of a nice way of saying that you are kind of rearranging a real story to be able to apply the writing techniques of thriller and crime novels. This episode is brought to you to by Saving keep an the audience City, engaged a and new have a level of suspense in, in the telling of the story. And, answering, and how do we make so a documentary a is more a straight following telling of this of is what happened, blah, blah, blah. Urban uh, docudrama uses all of these of techniques from thriller and crime and uh, those high risk. suspense forms Check out to sort of juice up a true story. And keep you engaged for multiple and now in podcasting for the multiple episodes. So that was my way back when. That was my first Ron experience Blotman with doing this kind of thing. Was where the essentially, we weren't the just telling the story of the Vietnam War. We were telling the Bay. It really attempted to engage Saving listeners city, in what they were hearing we because we were the same way again. playing with their emotions, I guess you could say, by the use of suspense and tension and all that stuff. Gotcha. Um, so I just want to clarify for a little bit more. Um, so you're saying sort of like a fictional true crime, I guess, so to speak? Is that- yes, right. Okay. So the, the current term in podcasting is true crime. They're really documentaries or docudramas, rather. But because so many of them deal with true crimes that have happened and I've been solved or are waiting to be solved, the whole docudrama genre has become known as true crime. And they use all the techniques of what we now see in so-called fiction podcasts or uh, audio drama. And the two forms borrow wildly from each other. So we get audio dramas now that use the structure of docudramas. And one of the earliest of the sort of things that launched this new golden age, what I call a new golden age of podcasting in fiction, was Limetown that appears to be a docudrama about the disappearance of 325 people from this research town in Tennessee. And it was interesting that when I first some time ago looked up this title, the first 
question that was asked as a result of a Google search is, is Limetown real? Which sort of says something about, you know, mm. the kind of manipulation that goes on and uh, uh, back and forth between audio drama and docudrama. This episode is brought to you by Saving the City, a new documentary series in production asking and answering how do we make our cities better places for all. Following decades of decline, most urban cores were celebrating almost 20 years of improvement, a transformation now at risk. Check out savingthecity.org for preview videos to find out more and perhaps even donate to the nonprofit series to help keep it going. The creator, Ron Blotman, was the mind behind the award winning PBS series Saving the Bay. After watching Saving the City, you will never look at cities the same way again. Now back to the show. In your mind, you distinguish between the golden age of radio and radio drama. Can you tell us a little bit more about why you distinguish those two terms? Well, I think in this country, radio drama pretty much deals with what was done in the golden age because hardly anybody except a few public radio stations now broadcast over the airwaves audio drama so it's not really radio drama anymore and i argue that the major breakthrough that happened that allowed these hugely successful programs like limetown and serial and homecoming is that radio drama was freed from the radio which allowed all kinds of freedom and different approach to distribution and all that kind of thing. The BBC still calls audio drama radio drama because nearly all their production is also aired on the radio. So that kind of makes sense. They're just beginning to come around to the American approach that says, well, it's really audio drama because practically nobody is listening to it on radio. They're all listening to it on ear pods and earphones and downloading it through Apple podcasts and Spotify and all those outfits. I think the real difference between those things, but you know, having said that, the way in which old time radio was done from about the late 1930s uh, with War of the Worlds through the end of Suspense, that amazing series uh, in about 1960 or thereabouts. Most of the techniques they developed and used are what nearly every producer with any success now does in audio drama or so-called fiction podcasts, as they're now often called. And really the period that began with the Star Wars series in 1981 really involved a reinvention of audio drama, making up for the 20-year gap from about 1960 to 1980, where everybody involved in radio drama moved to Hollywood. All the sound effects people, the performers, directors, writers, producers, and so on. And those of us who you know weren't alive then or didn't move ended up really forgetting how that work was really done. So there were long period of experimentation with radio drama, mostly done by NPR, uh, that was presenting it based as though it was a form of theater and very theatrical performance style, almost no use of sound effects or ambience, little or no use of score and so on, all those things that made the Golden Age work. And so with Star Wars, what we ended up doing was reinventing or reconceiving a contemporary way to do what was done in the golden age. And the result was in those in terms of the early 1980s, we got this huge audience, mass audience for contemporary radio drama, which had never happened before in the previous 20 years. So anyway, long winded answer to your question. You say that audio dramas are plot driven more than character driven and i'm wondering what makes something more plot based than character in your mind i think a very strong plot is the hallmark of nearly all of the currently wildly successful fiction podcasts now and when i say successful what i mean is the audience is millions rather than thousands which is kind of typical nowadays and there are some exceptions we can talk about in a minute, but basically it's a plot that begins late in the story. There is a hook 
that has some sense of suspense or tension about it that happens normally not only on the first page of the drama, but normally within the first 15 or 20 seconds of it. And then there's a suspense plot of some considerable weight so that the real issue the audiences are concerned about is what happens next. That's kind of the driving question throughout the series. And in a very sophisticated series uh, like Homecoming, from about 2016, you also identify with the central character, Heidi. And when you have that combination, you're in for a real treat and a very large audience. And of course, that was the first podcast, I think, that got picked up for adoption as a television series with Julia Roberts, no less, playing the the lead character. So that's really what that means. The way in those middle years from 1960 to about 1980 that audio drama sort of went off the rails is that theater was the model for who should write it and how it should be performed. And one of the characteristics of playwriting in this country and in England, for that matter, is that plays written for the legitimate theater, for the live stage, tend to have very mild, what you might call a suspense plot. Uh, that is, they these are plots that barely exist, and they're really there as an excuse to trigger emotional issues between the central characters in the play. And that works great in live performance, but it does not work well in audio. And why that is, I'm not sure, but that's that's the deal. In the same way that it doesn't work as well in feature film that feature film tends to deal with much stronger plots than we find in uh, theatrical situations. Gotcha. Sort of on that note, writers are sometimes told the to sticks to the strengths of their storytelling medium, like such as don't try to write a book like a movie, so to speak. I'm wondering why are audio dramas considered visual and not audible in some case, in a lot of cases? Well, I think that's, you know, to be honest about it, I don't know how widespread that belief is, but I believed from very early on in my work in audio that radio drama was visual storytelling and that it was like screenwriting, but it borrowed a little bit from theater. That is, what it borrowed from theater was the fact that you had to use dialogue a whole lot, but that through proper use of ambience and sound effects, you could actually lead the audience to see what was happening. And again, nearly all of the producers working today who are uh, producing these wildly successful fiction podcasts have adopted that point of view. And if you look at the scripts they write, um, they look like screenplays. That is, they or they have the feel of screenplays in terms of the way the, how much dialogue there is, how much each character says before another character says something, and so on. The main departure from contemporary screenwriting and feature film production is that in audio drama, often the central character is also a narrator. I would say it's probably true in maybe a third of the work that's out there, that it's equivalent of what Limetown started, that is where the, the radio reporter, because this is a, a fake documentary, really, or docudrama, the radio reporter also serves as a narrator who leads us through the story. So that's really my sense of it. I think there are a lot of theaters, non-profit resident theater companies around the country that are experimenting, taking plays they previously produced and recording them for audio and adding sound and music and sound effects to it. I've listened to a bunch of this and I find it really unsuccessful unless you're a total theater buff who, you know, is so missing live performance that you'll, you know, you'll listen to it with earphones. It doesn't move fast enough, and there's an artificiality in theatrical dialogue that works super well on stage, but doesn't work so well, I think, in audio drama. And that attitude, I think, is shared again by the producers of this really successful work, because if you listen to how they make it or what it sounds like when they're done, 
it's very filmic in its performance style. Uh, there's sort of an old joke that when you've been involved in the training of performers for the professional theater, of course, what happens is they go and perform in the theater for a little bit, but their real goal is to go to Hollywood and get, you know, start acting in film. And so, you know, often what happens is the performers stop by the office and they say, hey, I got my first film role. Any suggestions for me now that I've been in theater for two, three, four, five years or whatever? Mm. And the joke is that the correct advice is just say the lines. That is, don't act the lines. I mean, that's, it's an overstatement, but the message is uh, basically correct. That audio drama thrives on a kind of conversational, intimate style of dialogue that doesn't work on the theater stage and is also typical in film. And I think the reason for that is that the characters in audio drama essentially are standing right next to you and they are whispering or talking into your ears. So when there isn't any need for, you know, extreme emphasis of words or phrases or whatever, that the subtlest form of variation in delivery is captured by the microphone and transferred to your ears. So you don't need all that other stuff.